Hello everyone, welcome to the Giants podcast, uh, where we talk all things Rugby League and Huddersfield Giants. Uh, I'm your host Cameron Deacon, alongside me is Huddersfield Giants Hall of Famer Earl Crabtree. Thank you, good to be back. And we're also joined again by uh, Huddersfield Matchday announcer Tim Burton. Hello. And we're also joined by a very special guest. Um, a current first for the Giants podcast is a current Giants player with over 130 career appearances for club and country. He's also played for various teams across Australia and New Zealand. Only joining the Giants last year, he's made 23 appearances for the club, and it is the Huddersfield Giants prop, Suai Matagi. Thanks for coming. Oh, thank you, it's an honour to be here. <laughs> it's it's welcome, to, it's exactly an honour, but hey, no. <laughs> uh, Also, we may as well mention now that the sound may be a bit off of the uh, construction workers doing their bit for take that. Yeah, we've got <laughs> the stadium being built for the take that concert on... Uh, on Tuesday the 4th of June, like so there's a bit of noise patient. going down as the flooring is going outside. Are you going to be here for that, Earl? Um, I, I don't think I will be. I think we've actually all got given the day off, yeah. um, <laughs> simply because uh, they obviously take that's here and obviously we're such a massive, big um, organisation and what everything they have to do, they need to get everybody out of the way. So, yeah. um, you know, they'll be putting the uh, stand up as well, which hopefully won't be back for good um, because uh, you know it made a mess of the field last time didn't it? so oh yeah there might be a few more at some titles in there you keep your eye your ears open for this you might be you might be getting the day off i'm standing in for robbie that day so you know <laughs> <laughs> never oh, forget well. where you're coming from Earl. <laughs> because because uh, you have to shoot off uh, pretty soonish uh, we're going to start with the magic weekend and have a review over that and how uh Brilliant that was for yourself as well, so it's a brilliant 55-2 to two win over Hull, F- Hull FC. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it was, uh, were you there? <laughs> <laughs> I get confused, I get angry at me. <laughs> but yeah, amazing win, I thought. It's, yeah, do you know what, it's, I don't, well, I'll be honest, from my perspective, uh, I've, I've seen some improvement from the team over the last uh, few weeks especially, and we seem to be just getting better and better, but I don't know if anyone could have expected that scoreline. It's actually the biggest uh, winning margin in Magic uh, history yeah, as well. Yeah. And um, I, I think obviously everyone was really proud. I was sure we didn't get a few more fans to go mm. over and um, enjoy it along with the with the team itself because I thought they were sensational. I think it's one of those games where everything we did just seemed to turn out well, even when we did things wrong. Yeah. It seemed to just go right for us. Um, I thought it was a fantastic atmosphere down pitch side, pitch level was totally different from above. Um, a great occasion overall. And uh, what what an absolute yeah. pleasure to be there! I really enjoyed the full weekend, to be honest with you. And uh, Sue will probably tell you a little bit more. I mean, how did it feel out there? Yeah, it was um, like you said. Um, the atmosphere for me was uh, um, I'm I'm still buzzing now. Uh, <laughs> it was the first time being at Magic Weekend. Um, I felt special as well being uh, first time at the Liverpool um, you know arena. Um, that's crazy that stadium, and we got to. Um, Go up and down before uh, Wakefield and that, so we were stretching and stuff like that. Got a good insight into uh, the stadium, how it's running. Yeah, it's pretty crazy there. But uh, the whole day, uh, the experience was good. You know, we got off to a good start, and yeah, uh, it was a good win as well for us. Um, I thought it was a good 80-minute performance from the whole team. Uh, a massive uh, up to the spine. You know, the halves and the fullback and that, everyone just connected and they led the way for us. Do you think that's made a big difference then? Do you know with uh, Gasky coming back, uh, Oliver Russell's playing really well now, and uh, the forward pack as well, yourself, you, you, I think you're getting better personally from my point of view, being a fellow prop, uh, just improving week on week. Is uh, Do you think it's all coming together a little bit more now? Yeah, um, we struggled a bit um, you know, in the beginning of the year um, with you know some, some injuries in key roles, but um, it's coming together You know, the last couple of weeks and we knew if we just you know, continue to um, improve in you know little areas and build some momentum. You know, we'll go good. I almost feel like that performance has been coming for a while. You know, I think that we've been sort of getting near, and it and that you know it just clicked. Uh, I've been you know saying on previous podcasts that it's a long season, and I didn't feel there was any reason to panic, and I still don't think there's any reason to panic. You know, another couple of wins, we're right up there in the playoff positions. You know, and it's not about how you start the season, it's about how you finish, isn't it? So. Yeah, the business end of the season. Mm. I think someone makes a great point about 80 minutes and it's probably something they focused on because we haven't played really well consistently for yeah. 80 minutes of the game. It's been bits bits yeah, here bits and there, hasn't it? Yeah, been bits and pieces. Um, one thing I'll, I'll focus was um, this week and, and I think last week was getting our start right. If we if we could get our start right, we could build some momentum, build pressure and you know things will just evolve from there, which I felt like it did. Um, I felt we, we done the simple stuff uh, right 
and it paid off for us at the end. So we knew we just had to be in the grind. Even if we had to take seeing five minutes, just you know, continue to play boring football, uh, get to our kicks, build pressure, and you know, the results will come from that. And, and I thought that's what it did. It was our first 80 minute performance, and we we're happy as a team, but we know we've got to keep going. There's, there's more games ahead of this year, and we want to just build on this momentum and look forward to next week against Cusford. We talk about starting well. It's something that all players, all coaches say we need to start well. But for the fans, what does that look like? What do you mean by starting well in a game? What, what do you have to do? Uh, just like I said, the simple stuff um, you want to look at, um, at least completing your uh, first five sets. Uh, you want to get you know, get into motion, um, get the basic stuff, you know, building your foundation right. Um, and then it just comes off there. We know if we get those stuff right, our intent and uh, defence as well. Um, when you know when when the first up contact is as well, and we're winning the defense area, um, kick pressure, and all those little stuff, all the one percenters that uh, you know a lot of the fans don't don't look at, but um, <laughs> we know as a team that's what counts, and mm -hmm. we get all those little stuff right, we know we're heading the right direction. And despite that um, massive scoreline, you know, one thing that stood out to me massively compared to the last few games that I've seen was that that defensive side of the team was amazingly brilliant, and, and Jerry said it perfectly in the interview after the game. It was that the work that the forwards did in that on the back line, on the back foot for a lot of the game, it doesn't score and doesn't show it, but for that back foot on the defensive line was brilliant, I thought, and that forwards made the defenders look good, I think. So what would you, what would your take on that be? Yeah, um, I think it, um, everyone was just feeding off each other's um, energy, you know, um, and I think attitude was a massive one. Um, to keep them scoreless, I didn't realise until the end of the game, we, you know, we, they scored two no. points, but um, <laughs> it's a mess up, yeah. yeah. Like we knew coming into, um, you know, against Hull FC, um, they just beat, uh, you know, Warrington, you mm. know, um, following week, so we knew we were in for a tough one. Um, you know, they got big players like uh, Kikalian that they can score points, so we knew we had to do a massive job you yeah. know, with our defence, so uh, to keep them scoreless, they didn't score any tries, uh, you know, big credit to uh, the attitude of the team, I guess. Mm. You know, we're just all happy and then working for each other. And you called it last week, actually, listening back to a podcast last time. You said that if the wrong whole side turns up, then we'll walk over them. Because it's it's not the first time they've put 50 points spot on this season either. So it's, it's almost like I know what I'm talking about <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Fake it till you make it. Um, yeah, I, I always thought that. I just... Um, I've seen the improvement that we've made, again, especially at St. Helens. That was when we really showed a lot of character and a lot of attitude, even though we didn't come away with uh, the two, uh, well, the win, sorry, not two points for the Challenge Cup. But um, it, I saw something in the team then, and then we, we took it into the next couple of games and we won, uh, beating Hull KR London. Um, but we we didn't put the 80 minutes together, which is what we talked about. This is the first time we've done that, and I would, I would just... Uh, massively impressed the character attitude energy is a big word that we use because you can see it straight away within the team and um, the forwards don't get enough credit they never do they lay the platform for these halfbacks to give them a bit more time so he's been doing that tremendously mm -hmm. and um, I, I just think it all it all really did come together but you know I'm fed up with talking about the team let's talk about me for a, a minute or two <laughs> uh, <laughs> the magic weekend for me was a little bit different and I, I'm really proud of this because um, we talked about the the, the ride to Magic. Yeah. So we rode down to uh, Magic Weekend with Andy Kelly and a few other boys, 82 miles, and uh, we were raising money for Headway Charity in uh, remembrance of uh, Rona Costello. And we raised over £2,000, so we did really well. Uh, it was an interesting ride down there. Um, I had a bit of an issue with my back tyre. Luckily, we literally rode past the bike shop, so I ran in, <laughs> changed it over. It's like a pit stop. Did he recognise you? Um, uh, no, he charged me extra, actually. <laughs> I, I, I told him it was a charity. He went, yep, no problem, it's even more for you. <laughs> um, so we, uh, we had a great ride down there, very, very tough. And uh, we thought we'd made a bit of a mess up when we got to the stadium, and it was good as some park. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not even kidding, we had to check his maps and everything. I didn't realise how close it was. Yeah. It's oh, like, yeah, only about half a mile There's just Stanley something. Park separating them. I think it, they're the closest football grounds in the country to each other. It's madness, really. It, it is, and two stadiums that hold about 40,000, 40, 40, over 50,000. It's unbelievable. Just goes so to show what a football mad city that is, Liverpool, it, doesn't it? It's know? absolutely crazy. And um, it, after that, we obviously rode in. And um, I, I honestly would say riding to Anfield is a surreal experience, not because of how amazing it looks or anything like that but it's probably quite the opposite um, it felt like we're driving through the middle of Beirut um, it was uh, it, very very rough 
Just yeah. apologise to any Liverpool fans. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I do not apologise for that <laughs> area of Liverpool. It's it's actually quite sad to see. Um, yeah. You know, so much prosperity within the stadium and the players and things like that, and the amount of money. It's a shame nothing's done outside of uh, the stadium. It's not really for me to say, but I will do because I don't mind. Yeah. Um, Who's going to argue? And with and you it, to well, be fair. <laughs> um, it's not the nicest area, which was probably the major issue for holding an event like that in Liverpool, mm. but. I actually thought it ran beautifully well. We made quite a bit of money for charity and we did. We had a good ride. We had a good laugh on the way down there as well and a great Friday night as well in Liverpool itself. So mm-hmm. I can't complain. So that was my Magic Weekend. My Magic Weekend was a little bit different. Working for Super League as well, doing a bit of the on-field stuff and uh, at least I still manage to get on the pitch these days even if I don't have my boots on. Well done. It's very admirable of you to, <laughs> you know, to sort of uh, do the work that you're doing in, in the name of all those great charities. But how's the body holding? Because you know, did we are at you know the day after the you know the well, weekend. I've um, I've just been able to start walking properly. Yeah, um, a bit bow legged and uh, backside was a little bit sore for a couple of days, but uh, that's why I had to drink after. And that's why yeah. absolutely a bit of well, yeah, yeah pain well, relief. Well, that's why I made my own gin. It's just for <laughs> such an occasion. Um, but uh, yeah, it was very it was a tough old ride to get down there. It's a bit boring actually because it How stops far was there. It? Uh, we well, it's only about sixty. 65 miles we did 82 because we didn't yeah, yeah, go yeah. wrong we just took a detour yeah, just yeah. to make it a bit more challenging and uh, I'm glad we did because we, we covered some really good ground and, uh, and it did enjoy it. you know it's about raising money for, yes. for the charity and head away um, um, we had our esteemed guest Andy Kelly last week on the podcast um, how did Andy pull up did he was his body alright uh, miserable yeah um, as he always on is on the ride yeah just he was hor- do you know what it was horrible he started off in a Foul mood, absolutely <laughs> awful. I think it was because one of the other lads made us late, and then because who I was really, it? Name and shame. It was uh, Craig Morsdale. Craig Morsdale yeah. doesn't surprise so me. So he yeah. was late. Yeah. So Andy got in a bit of a huff. He set off. I was doing some social media stuff. They all went off around the corner. I didn't even set off. I set off and I went straight on. <laughs> so I did an extra mile and a half to find them again coming back. Uh, so within about five minutes, uh, Andy Kelly had rung me up asking where I am. Yeah, like, yeah, you've all just left me. Um, but you know, it, it didn't really matter. Maybe that's why my dad didn't want to approach you. You know, I got a text yeah. from my dad saying, I've just seen Earl Crabtree riding with a lot of cyclists doing little bit. <laughs> I, said, I said, Why didn't you go and say hello and introduce yourself? He said, Oh, I didn't want to. I felt a bit nervous. Maybe it's because Andy was in such a bad mood. He was, didn't. honestly. Yeah. He, I, <laughs> he, he, he's such a, he can be so miserable. Grumpy. Time. It's, it's, grumpy. it's grumpy. Yeah. It's, his, it's his age. Yeah. Let's be honest, it's his yeah. age. He's been through a lot as well. But um, he, he made it. He made it barely, just about. Yeah. Um, but he, he got it was a lot happier when we got there and cool. we got settled and then you like you said you did some work for Sky Sports there's something I want to ask you there was a comment made on Sky Sports about how our, our unentertaining team oh yeah previous <laughs> I won't mention which commentator it was but I think he, he he said he alluded to the fact that we were we play boring we're not very entertaining and then we went on to beat Hull 55-2. So. I think you're referring to John Wells, I think. <laughs> that might be the man, yeah, Earl, yeah. Why don't you just say his name? <laughs> and if he's listening, you know, good on you, John. Um, but yeah, do, do you know what, though? It's, I'm not saying like it's uh, an unfair comment. I think it's just off the back of us not performing great in the yeah, past. Sure. Um, it, it's easy to say that, and a lot of people, a lot of fans will pipe up now we've just put 55 points past the team. Yeah. We haven't been doing that all season. No. We have on this occasion. Yeah. So we weren't maybe that entertaining turning before I think we might be now yeah. and it's a fair comment off the back of that <laughs> yeah. so um, yeah you know that's what you do as a pundit you put you, you put it on the line and um, unfortunately John you got that one wrong pal some <laughs> comments come back to bite you Earl is there anything you've ever said on you know when you've been doing the punditry that's come back to bite you or have you I mean you've always been yeah. fairly on the mark here in the podcast <laughs> so. do you know I, I try and be controversial to a certain degree but not say anything too daft yeah. um, but I did once um, so I've said a couple of things in the past which I've not regretted um, but they have come back to bite me I um, said something about Ryan Bailey being a bit of a tool uh, <laughs> when he was playing he, he wasn't my favourite player he's not somebody I ever got on with um, I respect him as a player and what he did in the game but we always have this rivalry you know we're always giving it each other in games and stuff like that but it was uh, sort of a love-hate relationship and um, I, I sort of give him some stick about you know if he just focused on his game he'd be a lot better player than what he is mm. and he'd, um, he'd, he'd, he'd do even better Anyway, next thing, oh, 
fans or Leeds fans have picked up on it, put it all over Twitter, and he starts calling me out over Twitter and stuff like that. So I'm crying out loud. And I actually paid him a compliment to say he's got great ability. It'd be good if he's, you know, if he just sort of stayed on that rather than losing. Just calm down a bit. Calm down a bit, yeah. Stop being such a tool in games is what I meant. It's quite simple. And then the next one I did on a BBC. And it was on Super League show, and I think I uh, slagged off uh, Elwar Blissier, who I've had a few deals with in the past, so I didn't mind giving him a bit of grief. Mm-hmm. And he, he'd um, done something with Seb, and Seb just landed one on his nose. And um, I sort of uh, said that Lee were up to the usual dirty tricks and uh, trying to um, rough our team up. They come out cocky and to, you know the chest puffed out and stuff like that. But they saw it as a negative, and I didn't mean it like that. I meant that's what they do when they try and intimidate teams, and th- that sometimes almost like bullying them actually gets them through games to win. I was getting um, phone calls off the head coach saying how insulted they were. That is <laughs> really? such a thing. I was like, Who was the head coach? I, I can't remember what his name was. I mean, it, it, it meant that much to me. I can't remember who it was that phone. But uh, I apologised. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I apologised if they were insulted by it. Um, but I, I didn't mean an insult. I actually meant it as a compliment. They did a really good job at the time. Unfortunately, that year they got relegated. I didn't feel too much sympathy after having phone calls about how I've insulted them. But, um, you know, it's quite easily done. It's quite easy to upset people these days. And, That's um, the job, don't it? You know, you've got to be a bit controversial sometimes. Otherwise, it'd be no point watching it if it was just like me who sits yeah. on the fence all the time. I know, that's him just tries to team me up. and yeah. me after, I, Don't get me wrong, I don't want to be Gary Schofield. Yeah. You know, like, I don't want to get, I don't want to be hated by just about everybody. <laughs> uh, if you're listening, Gary, it's uh, good to see you at the weekend, Matt. Um, but, um, you know, it's it's all part and parcel what we do. You know, it's a bit sure. of profile. It's just to get an out there and uh, talking about the game I see no issues in it I think people do take things a little bit too personal these days yeah and bringing it back to the magic weekend itself you've been to you went to last few and how does it compare to Newcastle to Anfield was it how would you say it ranked amongst them um, for me Newcastle is the best buy Mm. a long long way it's got everything it has got everything yeah. the one thing I will say is when I was uh, at the pitch uh, pit side from upstairs I, I couldn't really hear much atmosphere and as soon as I went to the pitch I was like wow this is incredible and you see the cop end yeah. where Adam O'Brien scored didn't he and yeah. uh, Vijay scored there as well two massive uh, Liverpool fans uh, there's 12,000 people in that stand. So the atmosphere, you can really feel it, you can sense it, you can't even speak properly. And even to just think about what you're trying to say next, it was very difficult. It was unbelievable. So the atmosphere is, can be sensational. If you could get more fans there, I think it'd be unbelievable. Well, 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 a little story uh, you know, about one of our members of staff, another one of our esteemed guests, actually, the, the kit man and the culture. Apparently he went out and he was feeling all right and then he went out into the centre of pitch and apparently you'll never walk alone came over on the uh, on the stadium mm-hmm. sound system and apparently he burst into tears. And it was that, that emotional for him. So I wonder why that's I wonder what it meant. It's because he's walking on his own. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> it's just ironic. Yeah. That he's yeah. Down just walking he was his lost. Really upset about it. He was lost. Couldn't find his way back to the kitchen. And there's another little story off the back of this. I probably shouldn't be telling you this, by the way. Um, we came back with an extra massage bed. Did you? Yeah. Oh. Not owned by us. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually one of Liverpool's. Really? <laughs> and that's not even a joke. Uh, obviously, we've had to hand it back. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's ended up in the back of our kit kitchen man, I think. Oh, so Tully's getting blown for that one so yeah. um, it's uh, thieving massage beds from Liverpool I've seen now so again we are sorry for that we'll put them in the same cupboard as the 15 towels from Catalan I know right? yeah <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so are you you said before it's your first magic weekend this one has just gone and it's how, how does that compare to a normal match day because it is just at the end of it it's a normal match day number two points yeah um, well for me I'm, like like I said before I'm still buzzing now um, just a yeah, crazy atmosphere I can't um, like I try to think of the nines we used to have in the, uh, New Zealand. Um, yeah. We get over 40, 40 to fifty thousand. And I think um, this was just a bit louder and you know just a bit better the experience as well. Mm. So for me, it was yeah one of a lifetime experiences. Uh, dream come true for me. It's something that I remember. Uh, definitely, you know, put it down as uh, you know good memory. Put it in the memory bank. Uh, I don't know if anybody else has got anything to add to the Magic Weekend itself because personally, I thought it was brilliant as well. First Magic Weekend I've gone to. It was. As a spectacle of rugby league, it's you can't ask for much better than that. I don't think. I think it's just a great event, and there's a lot of talk now about you know the, you've got the the 
Summer Bash or the Big Bash, whatever the you know the Summer championship, Bash, yeah. the Summer Bash. Uh, they play at Blackpool for the championship and they talk about maybe combining the two, which I just think would be a fantastic event. I don't know how that would work logistically, whether you'd have to have it in the same town with two different stadiums or whatever. But, you know, I think if you're looking at improving things, uh, you know, maybe that would be that would be the way forward. I don't know. Yeah, I saw that as well and I thought that would be a fantastic idea. Because I don't think uh, the Summer Bash gets as many fans as it should do. No. And uh, neither does uh, Magic Weekend. Maybe combining the two somehow would be unbelievable, whether it would work logistically, like say, uh, trying to find the right venue as well. Mm. But um, it's so, I, I don't like the thought of us just keep moving around mm. everywhere. I no. think we lose its... Um, it has a little bit of impact, but I don't think we give ourselves the best opportunity of building on it because mm. it just complicates things a little bit. And that's why I love Newcastle, just because I felt like we we're getting some momentum there. And um, I think Newcastle itself realised the value that it adds because it's an event that brings, well, it's in about, I don't even know, about £10 billion to the economy, yeah. even just with taxi drivers and the food and restaurants and bars. Um, it's un- it's unbelievable. Well, I mean, you, you know, you mentioned the sort of the surrounding areas of, of um, you know, Anfield Road, and I don't want to be derogatory about that, but, you know, Newcastle was perfect because the stadium's right in the city centre. So if, you know, if you wanted to, didn't want to watch one game, you could go out and have a few drinks around the centre, get something to eat. There was plenty, you know, plenty there, whereas I'm not sure that's the same with Anfield, but, you know, there we go. And I think actually they were um, whoever designed the Huddersfield kit for that day was a uh, did a good job because they were pandering to all the neutral Liverpool fans who were there. Sure. Quite clearly, the, yeah. the red kit. Don't want to miss an opportunity. No, we got a lot of stick yeah. over that as well by uh, quite a majority of our fans, but we still sold a few at the same time. And it's mm-hmm. it's probably not everyone's favourite, but it's it's weird how things sometimes turn out, isn't it? That's the biggest score that we've uh, anyone's had at Magic Weekend. We're wearing red at Anfield. I just thought it was very apt at the end of the day. So. Yeah. Very proud, very happy of the team, and also the fact that uh, that kit, that one-off kit, will be remembered for that. So sure. it's amazing. What, I wonder what was the dressing room like after that win? Because you, you talk, you talk about sort of you know amping up dressing rooms after the game, but that must have been something else. Surely. No, it definitely was. Um, it was good to see it. Um, it was good to see a smile from. I'm Simon Wolford as well. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was just <laughs> wind, mate. <laughs> didn't smile, it was just wind. Yeah. No, but everyone was all happy and stuff. Um, yeah. Said it should be because it was a good, you know, good performance. And um, no, it was just, it was just a good, you know, feeling in the change rooms. And you know, we put it into this week as well. So we know we've got a massive job next week, and we've just got to continue putting the work to build that momentum going forward. You mentioned the the, um, the, the is it was it is it the Auckland Nines? Yeah, in Auckland New Nines. Zealand. Yeah. yeah. So you, you grew up in New Zealand. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your background and? Sort of how you started playing rugby league, and um, uh, we'll move on to how you ended up in Huddersfield yeah. eventually. Yeah, yep. Um, yeah. uh, raised um, raised in West Auckland, New Zealand. Um, pretty much uh, started playing footy at the age of nineteen, so I started late. Um, had a you know different route compared to a lot of a um, lot of other players that come through the system. Sure. So. It was a late late decision that I made. Um, it was one day I didn't want to live with any regrets, and that's why I started late. Um, started uh, just went signed up for a local footy team um, called Charity Roosters. That's out in West Auckland. Um, spent a couple of years there, and then I started to get a feel for uh, a love for the game, and um, started you know setting goals, and I moved on to Manabat Lions. Um, they were uh, the champions, uh, champion club at that time. So the Auckland Fox Memorial is uh, a competition where Kumatai and Sebastian get here for and so that's the pinnacle of uh, rugby league in New Zealand. So uh, they were playing for the South Auckland team while I was in the West Auckland team, and I moved to Mount Albert. Uh, spent a couple of years there, and I started uh, making rep teams. And you know, the more I uh, got into the rep team and stuff, uh, the more I felt closer to you know um, playing in the NRL, which was my biggest goal at the time. I, you know, which I didn't think would you know come possible. So. Uh, one team from another uh, making this rep team I was like oh, okay it's getting closer and closer one step away and you know just started putting in the hard work and stuff and eventually um, got opportunity the doors open and um, yeah five years later 2013 I was contracted picked up a trial contract uh, to New Zealand Warriors and uh, grabbed that with both hands and you know never looked back mm. uh, really is an un- unconventional route mm. into into professional rugby you know especially Especially, you know, into the NRL, there's, there's so many players out there. So it's a massive achievement to, 
to make it through that route. So how did you find the transition from sort of playing, you know, amateur or semi-pro rugby league into, you know, making the transition into a full, full-time NRL player? Yeah, um, it was massive for me. Um, like I said, before I even um, become professional, I was working full-time, 12 hours. Um, I was a delivery driver, so I was going around to all the hotels in the city. It was it was a physical job, so um, 12 hours, 66, and then I had to find time um, after work to put in the training or go to training so you know by the end of the day I was sort of naked and um, when I did get my breakthrough to the NRL it was a massive jump because um, you know um, usually people well, we have an under 20 system and usually you go from the under 20s to the New South Wales um, uh, cup is you know the reserve grade usually those are the steps um, so the step I took was um, Auckland Fox Memorial so it's like um, uh, I forgot uh, one of the what's the camp because they have here they have the championship and then what's underneath the championship championship one yeah yeah and then league, what's after yeah. the one uh, they've got the national conference league after yeah. that so, yeah, you, so you're looking at so like you're under banks and teams like yeah, that yeah, yeah, so sure. that's, so that's the kind of comp I was playing yeah. Yeah. so I was playing from there and I, I went from there skipped all in between and went straight into <laughs> throwing in the deep end <laughs> yeah. yeah but uh, for me you know going from my 12 hour job mm-hmm. I was just I was just hungry and keen for you know opportunity, yeah. and I know yeah. that you know it doesn't come come often, and especially like that. So when it did come, um, I knew I had to just put my head down and, and and work hard, and whatever comes, you know, go. And um, I remember my first preseason um, it was the hardest hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life. <laughs> Uh, our first run we'd done, I, I started thinking, man, why did I choose this as a career? <laughs> <laughs> I was having those thoughts. I was like, man, do I give up now? Was 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 that tough? But I remember I looked to my left and right and I saw, you know, the guys like Manu Watuwai, uh, Ben Matalini. I was like, man, if I can, like, um, be put through, you know, so much pain, but, you know, besides these guys, that's a dream come true for me. So I looked at it that way and, it, you know, it sort of paid off and just kept putting one step, you know, in front of the other or one foot in front of the other. Unbelievable. Can you actually remember your first game in the NRL? So you've made that massive leap from, you know, sort of underbank to New Zealand Warriors. Can you actually remember yeah. that, that first game? And no, definitely. I still remember still remember the date, uh, May the 9th, 2013. Um, Sam Rapier, which was playing here. Um, I was 18th man, so um, I didn't find out till after the captain's run, uh, Sam Rapier got injured and uh, the coach met Elliot at the time, tapped me on the shoulder and told me, oh, you know, you're, you're making your debut the following day. And uh, I don't think I've ever rehearsed or trained for that that moment. You know, I don't know what's going to come come right then. It was round nine, so... I don't know how to direct. I don't know yeah, to be excited or what. I was like, man, I, I remember I didn't sleep that night. And I was like, man, what's man? It's all it's all coming, you know, um, it's all coming now. And we're playing against the uh, Canary Bulldogs, and I remember we had the likes of Frank Pritchard, Sam Cassiano, and that, and that too. I was going against, and it was pretty scary at the time. But I remember running on the field, man. I was like, um, I was still buzzing, stars, everything. Just I was starstruck. Hey, and even when I was going into the tackles, I, was, I still couldn't believe. You know, the dream was. Um, it was all happening, so for me, I was still buzzing out. Even though I was, uh, I was blown for the first five ten minutes. <laughs> I was just, I was just grateful for the dream. I didn't even know what was happening. It was just all felt like a dream, man. Still, still remember to this day. But I was scared at the same time because, uh, you know, you, you grow up watching, you know, the likes of Frank Pritchard and that, um, what they're capable of, and you know, going up against that tough four pack, that Clemmer, that Sam Cassiano, and that. Um, no, but you know, to. To go and put your body on the line and stuff like that, that's, that's one of the highlights. In that position as yeah. well. I remember it a long time ago, obviously, and I don't remember the exact date like you do, because that, that's not so obviously meant that much to you as well. Like, you remember the exact date. Mine was in 2001, I remember that much. That was, that was like <laughs> a lifetime yeah. ago. Uh, but I remember going up against uh, like Tuara Nikau, who was yeah. one of my uh, favourite players ever and I remember him just giving me a forearm straight across the face and I'm like <laughs> you know that for me it was like oh wow this is awesome <laughs> he actually took my head off um, and I just remember it like clear as day and then later on going and playing against Stu Field and put my nose straight across my face as mm. well and you're playing against your heroes and they're trying to kill you it's amazing <laughs> it's, it's just such a weird weird uh, sort of concept uh, unfortunately, guys, I'm going to have to love you and leave you if that's okay, but which is a bit frustrating because I'd love to hear a bit more about Sui and uh, your sort of upbringing as well. And I hope you manage to go into that because that is an amazing story in itself and um, unconventional, like you say, but uh, you're here. Um, 
laying the platform for the Giants. So it's a testament to your character, and um, I hope you obviously stay around for a long, long time because <laughs> I think you're an amazing person, um, massive influence uh, on the team, and um, I hope the fans uh, start to realise that as well because uh, you do so much for this club, and um, I look forward to seeing a claret of gold for uh, for a number of years, mate. So well, thank, thank you, thank you. Guys. Right. I will take my leave, guys. Thanks so much. Yeah, I'll close the door on your way out. <laughs> <laughs> Careful, man. I'll jog you out here as well. <laughs> Enjoy it. Cheers. Cheers, Cheers So, how long did you spend at the Warriors after, you know, sort of making your debut, Sue? Um, I think, um, yeah, it was three years. So, I spent uh, three years there um, before I made the move over to Australia. Yeah. Um, it was one of the best experiences because... Um, New Zealand Warriors is the only team in New Zealand, so that's the only team you sort of mm. watch and you, know, you want to play for as a kid or you know you dream to. And I got to do that and um, you know around uh, awesome blokes, you, you know, the players, uh, staff, and that you know you play with your uh, your your heroes pretty much. And mm. you know it's a it's an experience I'll never forget for myself. And it's always you know always um, it's always amazing to see like you know the likes of Sebastian and and Akuma because I was there mm. at the same time and to come back and link up and hear how this feels. Yeah, it's it's awesome. And it, one one thing I well, I don't know much about the nature of New Zealand and rugby in itself, but one thing you do know and you notice it when you, you, they play and you watch them play is this the passion they have and it's almost like a ritual sport in the country. I don't know if you'd you'd say that yourself, but it's you, you came into the sport relatively new. Had you not played at a younger level uh, through childhood or whatever? Is it not just something that you're dragged into? Really, is what in my head. It's what <laughs> yeah. It was. Um, I think. I probably only played the under eights. That's probably all I remember, um, and then pretty much left after that to right. under under eights, maybe under nines. And it was something that I just let go and just you know I said well, I didn't want to play it. And, mm. and yeah, I didn't. I didn't <laughs> actually. Um, it was not one of those things where well, you know I wanna, um, it was a dream. It was a dream of mine. I remember at the age of six or seven, right. and then um, played with um, yeah played under eights or nines, and then that was it. I pretty much um, hanged the boots from there and. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know why, then uh, mm. you know, pursued and just keep playing through the grades. But you, you've also you're also part of you know you've got a big family yourself. Is it f- five of the brothers you've got? Yeah, or six all up here. Yeah, 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 that's like um, obviously a massive family. Do they all play rugby as well, or are they? Yeah, they were. Um, I remember um, my second eldest. Uh, he used to always try and drag me along to to play and you know try and sign me up. But uh, you know, I was just, nah, I'm not bothered. <laughs> don't want it, and you know, don't want to play. So yeah, they all pretty much uh, played, but never got to the level I was at. Yeah. So what what was it then? Cause if you were so, you know, you, you said you left it after like under eights. What was it that dragged you back in? Um, like, uh, when I did start, um, I started realizing, um, you know, I had, I started a family at a really young age. So um, it was that fact of not having any regrets. I started having those uh, those thoughts, you know. Um, you start thinking as you get older, um, you know, the legacy and how, how you want to be remembered. And mm. those are the things that were playing on my mind at the time. And I knew, um, like I said, at the age of six, was to, you know, I had that um, dream to become, you know, an NRL player. And um, I didn't want to, you know, f- five or ten years from, from that time, you know, when I was 19, that, to, you know, if I was to look back, I didn't want to have any regrets whatsoever. You know, I just wanted to make sure I gave myself uh, every opportunity, you know, there was. And even if I did... You, you know, even if I didn't get it, um, I would have been proud of myself that I gave you know myself the best shot. Yeah. Do you actually remember a defining moment when you thought, do you know what, I can actually do this? I can actually go and play in the NRL. Yeah. Um, I still remember it was uh, f- from when I started at nineteen. Um, it was four years later. Um, you know, like I said, I was working um, twelve hours non-stop. So um, you know, if I five days a week, 12 hours, uh, and then training at the same time. And I started really after three, four years chasing and pursuing this dream, it started to take a toll on me. I was starting, you know, I had to wake up. If I was to put in some training, I had to wake up at four o'clock in the morning, try and fit in before I go to work or after. Mm. And, you know, working those long hours, you know, you, you barely got any energy by then, but you still gotta um, try and fight, you know, um, try and push for that spot. But I remember on the fourth year, I was, I was um, I was at this club, Manor but Lions, and um, I was, yeah, pretty much close as to giving up. And I remember heading back home, and I told um, you know, my wife, and I'm gonna throw it in. And yeah. It was, for four years, man, I, I was like, you know, really, pretty much just naked. Really, it was, you know, it was a, uh, I didn't really 
I wasn't sure myself if you know this this door was going to open after four years. And uh, it was one thing my my wife said to me that was you know if, uh, she goes. Um, You've come this far, you're not stopping on me now. I haven't come to support you after you know, these three, four years. <laughs> you better uh, pick it up and harden up and, and, and go back. And for me, that was a defining moment with a frick. You know, you stop feeling sorry for myself and actually go. I don't know how close I was until a few months later, that same year. Um, that's when uh, I played my last rep game, New Zealand Residence. That was um, the highest rep, um, rep level you could make in New Zealand. And I, I remember finishing um, that year and I thought that was it for the year. And I was lucky enough, Matt Elliott was, was there. He was the first time he, he just got signed as coach for New Zealand Warriors yeah. and he just had to be there um, you know, to watch our game. And I got man of the match that um, that game as well. And I thought that was it for me. And then um, he tapped me on the shoulder and he told us, you know, um, you willing to come in for a three months um, trial contract. Um, you're not really getting paid for it, but it's a trial contract and we'll see you know, where you go from there. Yeah. And it wasn't until halfway through that, um, that preseason contract, you know, two months in, um, even though you know getting smashed and through the preseason stuff, I, I started realizing, man, I'm I'm literally here. I'm one step closer, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, when I was 19, this, you know, um, this is the dream. This is the major goal that I, you know, set for myself, and I'm actually here. I'm one step forward, and it's up to me to, you know, to go with both hands and, and keep pushing, no matter how hard how hard it, you know, got. And yeah, it was it was that the final moment that. That made me realise, you know, I'm <laughs> here with Manu Vatua, um, the likes of yeah, Sam yeah. Rapira, you know, all the guys that you grew up with, even Wookie, Sean Johnson, and you're like, man, I'm actually one step closer here. Um, i got to just put my head down and keep going forward. And and um, I didn't know if I'd done enough, but mm. I just remember giving, um, giving myself, you know, everything there was. And at the end of that uh, three months, I got caught in, and, you know, it was D-Day for me. I didn't know whether I was going to um, carry on or... Yeah. Or get a contract or not. So um, Dean Bell, who was a recruitment officer, I think he played for Wigan back yeah, then. He yeah, played for Wigan. Yeah. yeah, he called me in the office and I was like, "Man, is he going to give me a contract or not?" Because the guy before me, uh, we were on the same contract. Um, he told me he didn't get. So I was like, "Oh wow, that's a pretty tough way to cut for it." So <laughs> did I, you think I, your chances had improved yeah, at that I was, point? <laughs> <laughs> I should have seen him or asked him. So I was like, "Oh man, it's not really good." But then. Um, Shook my hand and goes, you know, congratulations, we're gonna give you a, uh, you know, contract, um, mm. a full time contract. And I don't know what that was, you know, at the time, but didn't <laughs> yeah. know what that meant. Um, so I was like, oh, what does that mean? And he explained to me. So I went into my, you know, my old job and explained it to my boss, and he was happy for it as well. And mm. That was yeah. the day. I, yeah. Were you, st- were you still having to work full time during your three month trial period? Uh, it was half and half, um, but it was a massive sacrifice because I wasn't getting paid, so um, yeah. it was a tough one for me having a family as well. Yeah. But um, we managed to get through. But I remember that three months contract, yeah, we pretty much, um, it was all for the opportunity, no money at all. So uh, I knew that was, you know, the cost, you know, f- um, you got a dream, you know, something's got to, um, you got to sacrifice something. And I think that was a sacrifice that mm-hmm. eventually paid for it. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad it, it paid off, you know, I took a gamble in it. Do you think the route that you took into the professional game makes you more grateful for what you've got as, you know, as, as being a professional athlete and, you know, you've, you've obviously had to go and work other jobs and, you know, come through, come up through a harder route, you know, yeah. do you, do, do you, th- do you appreciate it more than other, other lads, do you think? Yeah, or? no, definitely. Um, I, every day I treat, every day, um, I'm, with gratitude, I wake up every day, I'm just excited to go to work, um, see, the, see the lads because I remember going, you know, I was working um, four to five years, a normal job, so um, I've done the hard yards, you know, my first job was picking strawberries, <laughs> very funny, so it was, all, yeah. labouring was all hard, hard work, you know, yeah, yeah. it was smashing your body through that, so um, compared to coming in and you're just training the gym, that's that's the mighty dream right there, so for me, I'm grateful every day, um, no matter, even, even though it's a hard day, um, I sort of know, you know, I've, I've done the hard labouring jobs yeah. before and it's, it's nothing compared to that. And, oh, go on. So uh, obviously you, you you did the three years at the Warriors. How did the move come? How did the move come about to the Roosters after that? Yeah, um, there was a lot of competition at the time, um, was, and and we just lost Matt Elliott as well. So Matt Elliott's the one that gave him opportunity, um, and we weren't getting picked. So I wasn't getting picked at the time, uh, and I started to realize, oh, uh, you know, if um, if I'm not on the coach's plans, um, I've got to start um, arranging things in. Mm-hmm seeing what, what it was so 
I was just straight up with uh, the coach, Andrew McFadden at the time, and, and asked him, well, if I'm not in your plans, are you willing to give me a release so I can, you know, pursue um, this dream and further, please, you know? I just told him the truth and how it is, and, and he, yeah, he pretty much told me the truth, so it was, it helped out, you know, in both ways, he told me the truth, and then so the opportunity to come, uh, Sydney Roosters, um, yeah. they were looking for a prop at the time, because um, I believe two of the other props had been suspended for that year. So, you know, the timing couldn't come any, any better and they were looking <laughs> for a prop. So, uh, yeah, I took the massive leap of faith, never been to Australia at this time. And, um, you know, looking to reside there as well was a massive jump for me. Um, and my family, you know, wife was, wasn't too sure at the time as well. But I, you know, I knew uh, big things, you know, you got to take a you know, step, step of faith sometimes. And um, you got to take a step out of your comfort zone if you want to achieve um, chief thing so that's what I did I moved over um, spent the first three months by myself in um, in Sydney and yeah, it was a massive jump but you know looking back now I was um, really grateful for the lessons we learned you know along the way must have been really tough when you're going from you know a country you're familiar with a culture you're familiar with you know uh, where you've got your family around you to go into a completely different environment with you know without your family it must have been some some tough times there yeah, no, it definitely was. Um, I was lucky enough to have um, some of my, um, some of the guys I looked up to as well at that club. They were a good club. They uh, looked after me. Um, you know, likes of um, Sam Moore, um, Hargraves. You know, uh, there's some big players there, but uh, they looked after me. There's some some New Zealand players in there as well that yeah. that made it home for me as well. So the transition bit for me was, um, you know, came comfortable. But uh, the hard one for me, I was thinking about the wife and the kids when they come over. Sure. But yeah, when they did make the move over, um, they fell in love with it. You know, the the lifestyle, the culture, yeah. uh, the beach. You know, one minute away, it was a good ex experience. Bit like Huddersfield. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good one as well. But, but yeah. I told him, "Oh, there's no beach here." <laughs> but, awesome. Yeah. But, 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 uh, what 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 amazes me actually, because you, you've got such a clearly such a vivid memory of your sort of early career, and and you've got such a you know. You're so grateful for what you've had at the moment. It's it must have been amazing for you when you got to play in the uh, internationally with uh, in the World Cup and what was that like for you? Yeah, it was um, man. Like I said, man, a massive dream come true for me. Um, when I set this goal at 19, um, was to play in the NRL. Um, one of them was to represent New Zealand, uh, yeah. Kiwis and, and Samoa. So on my first year, um, I remember I was in and out, made my debut, um, and it was coming to the end of um, you know the season. And I remember I, uh, I caught a glimpse at the World Cup, you know, um, mm. in a few months' time, and it was held in England. Mm. And I was like, man, I would love to play for that, man. Um, it was a dream come true if I ever got, you know, to pick to play for Samoa in the World Cup. Um, man, I would be the happiest person ever, you know. And, um, but, because, you know, it was a rookie year for me, so I didn't know, you know, they had a lot of players to pick from and stuff like that. So, um, man, at the end of the season, I thought that was it for me. But, um, Get my hopes alive. I was waiting, man. They're gonna name the team. They're gonna name the team, and uh, yeah, I got I got picked to play in the World Cup, and I still remember to this day, um, you know, everywhere we went through the preparation, going to Australia before we made the move here into Warrington, mm -hmm. and that was a great experience, you know, uh, itself coming to England for the first time. Never thought I'd travel, you know, and someone that was working twelve hours to, you know, making a move uh, to Australia and then uh, and come to England. So that experience itself, I, you know, I still cherish that for you know, the rest of my life as well. Yeah. I look back now, it's crazy, and now residing here and playing for Huddersfield Giants is, is <laughs> what I remember. Who was coaching Samoa at the time? It was uh, Matt Parrish. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so Matt Parrish, and we had Sean Long. So oh, all right, yeah. He had Sean Long as his assistant coach, and it was, uh, you know, it was, it was awesome. He was showing us the ropes and showing yeah. us, you know, where to go here and there. But we learned a lot from Matt Parrish and um, Longy. And it was a good, you know, good experience, a uh, good campaign as well. Um, we, we just fell short, um, mm. you know, against, I think it was Fiji, you know, uh, going into the quarterfinals. Mm. And, and one other thing as well, in, in 2014, you were, you were chosen to represent Samoa and New Zealand. Yep. And then you had to make that choice. How does that, how do you, how do you mentally make that choice in your head from the country you birthed, the one you've represented yeah. before? And Yeah, for me, um, it was a really tough one. Um, it was probably one of the hardest decisions um, to make. Um, was not any of my decision. Um, you know, wife, um, family, we had to sit down and really think about it. Um, like I said, uh, my family are uh, uh, born and raised up in Samoa. Um, and, you know, the family was split in a way. Yeah. Um, my uncle, um, who's, uh, you know, the, uh, he's, 
he's part of the staff in the Samoa team as well. Right. He thought that I was automatically kicking some more. But uh, to be honest, I didn't sleep that week. It was the hardest wow. decisions ever. But when I look back now, when I when I did, I was actually um, it was actually a good good thing for me to go through that you know you know the process of how to make these um, massive decisions and. Um, you know, one of them just based it down on um, what I want to achieve in life, and you know, if I was to ever look back um, with no regrets, um, you know, I know with you know the route I chose and you know the way I came through, opportunities like this didn't come often. No. And you know, I was starting to think, man, if um, if this Kiwi, um, you know, the Kiwi opportunity present itself, no one knows. You know, with um, rugby league, you don't know how long your career is going to be, as you hear, you know, a lot of injuries. Um, whatever, like, like anything like that. So I, I just, you know, came down to that. I, I just wanted to um, put down, you know, tick the boxes, um, you know, I represented some on the World Cup and, um, you know, I wanted to grab this Kiwi one because I didn't know if it was going to come again. Yeah. And, I, and that's how, and, you know, at the end of the day, um, I, I chose it and I know I disappointed a lot of people at the time, <laughs> <laughs> even family making that move. But, um, yeah, it was the one basically for me because I know, um, you know, living with regret can be one of the hardest uh, you know, feelings you know, for yourself to go through or you know, to hold on to. Mm. Mm. And the family are over it now? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, hopefully the uncle's still you know, un- hopefully he's still um, you know, over it, but yeah. he didn't, um, I seen him too. Um, he, gave me, you know, he didn't give me a good look, so I knew that he was still <laughs> holding on to a bit of grudge when I saw him um, after the campaign and stuff. But <laughs> it was funny, he was, um, we actually played him so when I made my debut oh, against the Kiwis, because uh, yeah. we, we had all those um, meetings and traditional stuff uh, during the week, the build up, and we got to meet up with the Samoan team. We've done all our cultural dances and hackers mm. and stuff like that. And he was actually, you know, across the room from the other side. Uh, I was like, <laughs> Did he speak to no you? eye contact. No, <laughs> like, <laughs> it, was, it was really tough. I was like, oh, wow. Well, Did the no, Samoan boys target you? Did they, did they try and give it you? Yeah, uh, I think so. But, um, <laughs> even like, during the prep and stuff, um, you know, a few of the boys were saying hello. And you could tell it was like, oh, it was a bit weird, and you know, it was, yeah. it was a bit different as well. It was um, last year, uh, you know, I was in camp with them, and now we're going against him. And mm. the haka, we, when we done the haka against each other too, that was a really tough one for me because yeah. I split, you know, both ways in a way. Because mm. uh, I was born in New Zealand as well, so um, but my heart, you know, the heart was both, yeah. it was both Kiwis and Samoa. So man, what do you do here? So, you know, they I just make sure I gave it my all and give it my best, and that's probably one of the hardest things to do, I guess. Well, if you're out split, you know, you did the right thing, didn't you? You've done it. You've done it. You've done both of it. So yeah, you know. And then, obviously, since then you've uh, you've moved on from the sort of rolling hills of New Zealand to the rolling hills of Huddersfield, and the uh, it's not quite as warm as it is in Australia either around here. But how have you found it since moving in there into Huddersfield? Oh no, um, for me, uh, man, I loved loved every single day of it. Um, even though it's been cold, um, I know it's out of my control, so yeah. you can't control that. <laughs> I knew coming over here, I'd come off with an open mind. And I knew about England, um, you know, with the snow and all that kind of stuff. But uh, I came, I think I, I came, you know, mentally trying to prepare myself for it. But it was a, you know, good winter. I uh, actually enjoyed it, even though it was cold. Um, you know, lucky we had the gas heaters at home to uh, you know, keep yeah. me warm when you're home. But I was going to say, it's... it's- you uh, got mentioned to me before it was your first Christmas in the UK here yeah. this year so what's that like for you to be away from home for that? yeah it was um, it was a good one I guess because um, we got to spend it just with the family um, usually we'll, we'll all link up before the family back home and we'll have a massive feed and stuff but this year was a bit different um, it was just us um, but it was you know there was a massive one for us as well you know I think it's our first ever Christmas to get to spend mm. Together, and I think I think it was a snow. I think it did snow, or I think it was a good day. A yeah, a little bit. <laughs> we were actually hoping it was snowing, and a lot of people I talked to were like, "Oh man, I hope it doesn't snow and stuff." Yeah. And we were we were actually hoping that um, the snow will come. When you first arrived, you didn't 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 you arrive in the summer when you first came? Yeah, I came come the summer, and, um, and it was a good summer as well, yeah, wasn't it? Was, it was yeah. It, was, it didn't feel like I left home. I was like, yeah, God, really, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was. The summer was better than uh, Sydney, I think. Like yeah. It was, yeah. And, you know, the sun goes down um, late, 8 30. I couldn't believe it. Uh, we, you know, our first game was against St. Helens, and I remember looking at the, um, the time, and it was 8 o'clock, and the sun was still out. And I was like, man, this is great. I don't know what everyone's talking about. Because <laughs> you hear stories, people come here and stuff, and I'm like, hey, the weather's terrible. And I was like, oh, man, that, 
So when you know the opportunity to come, you're like, man, you're having thoughts of man. Uh, this guy, this guy said this, this guy said that, and you're, you know that's the back of your mind. So oh, when I come over, it was, man, it was the best. I, I don't think you can um, be today. The best summer, the best winter I heard yeah. too. So I was like, oh man, what's everyone talking about? Or did I bring the weather over for me? So when you so when you'd been here for a while and you sort of getting you know the weather was all right. When we, well when was the first point that you thought, man, this is cold? <laughs> oh, um, today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we had training with. Uh, I must admit, we had training with uh, Batley, and it was, uh, I think it was just before Christmas. And uh, I, mean, I thought the coaches that were going to call training off was <laughs> minus, minus one or two, I think. I remember I, I was rattled at, that night and the following two days. Like, I had brain freeze and everything. I was like, man, these guys must be crazy. How do they train? <laughs> and I'm looking at all the English boys and many English had a single on, and I was like, man, you must be crazy. I, like, I, I was trying to recover. I did. I tried not to tell anyone. I was like too embarrassed to tell anyone. I was like, "Mate, has anyone else got a brain freeze and stuff?" So, <laughs> I was like, "Mate, there needs to be an investigation." <laughs> were, you, were you training in the snow? Like? No, it wasn't. Um, no, nah, it was just it was just cold as the coldest I've ever had. Yeah. I was like, "Wow!" I was like, "Surely the coach is yeah. going to call this off." Especially, you know, it was always September. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I thought. Um, Jim was going to call it off. He's from Australia and surely it was cold for him, but uh, yeah. I know we carried on, so yeah, I still remember that. Hopefully, don't get too many of those days. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and since then, you've obviously, season's been going. You know, how, how, how would, what would your view on the season so far be? Um, yeah, it's, it's a tough one, but I, I know we're heading into the right direction. Mm. Um, and I know as a team, uh, we've been working on just trying to get our, our starts, trying to build um, the simple stuff and... Um, I think one of the focus areas was our discipline. Um, it's 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 hard to win games when you know um, the discipline and you know errors and yeah. the, you know all co- compounding. So if we can uh, work on just keeping our discipline um, good, um, I think we'll go a long way. And it's still exciting times for us. I think we're we're only getting started um, for us. So. And the other thing I wanted to ask, actually, I forgot to ask before, was the that move from NRL and Australian New Zealand football uh, rugby. Is that what's the difference between? Uh, Super League in that for you. Um, if there yeah, is a difference, yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough one. Um, is it both? Uh, it's sort of tough. I think um, probably the only difference, I guess, is um, they have a lot more wrestle. So I don't know if you watch yeah, any yeah, of the yeah. NRL games. I think they're massive in their wrestle and all their groundwork. Hmm. Um, and yeah, I, I think that's probably the only difference um, over here. It's, it's still tough footy. And yeah. I think um, over here, yeah, it's, it's a lot tough because you know um, you've got to prepare for the weather as well. So you've got to mentally <laughs> get some ready for that. <laughs> but we've been lucky enough. I think this, um, you know, this season, you know, there's, yeah. hasn't been too much rain and it hasn't been too cold. But I think, um, yeah, pretty. I think probably just a wrestle, I guess. Um, then you know you watch the um, the teams like Melbourne Storm and stuff. Yeah. You, you you gotta try and um, fight to get a quick play ball and stuff because uh, they do a really good job to try and wrestle you and put you on your back and slow everything down. So I think they spend a, a lot of the time in the NRL working on, you know, the groundwork, mm. you know, all those little uh, movements with the wrestle. But besides that, it's pretty much uh, tough, you know, uh, tough footy, both ways. And um, I was gonna mention this is like. I'm, I'm just sort of fascinated by how amazed the, what, the weather you are, first of all. But it's like, I, I was trying to think which has been the worst conditions game. And the, the, honestly, the worst one this season I can think of was at Anfield. Because that was the only one that I've actually seen a bit of rain at, yeah. to be fair. I can't remember. I mean, there must have been some bad conditions earlier on in the season, mm. February. So, yeah. Yeah. You must be glad oh, you didn't join last year, because last year was terrible. Yeah, I remember some of the boys were telling me... Um, they got pneumonia and um, they're to uh, have hot showers at half time. So I don't know if they're trying to scare me or something. <laughs> no, <laughs> but we I haven't, haven't had anything. To I remember saying. going to watch a game at St. Helens once and it, it snowed and it, 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 I mean, it really snowed. And uh, they didn't call it off, they just went on with a brush and just brushed off the lines. <laughs> brushed, they just brushed the snow off the lines so that, so that so the boys could see the lines yeah. and that was oh, it. Just crazy. On. Um, so, yeah, I mean, after the Roosters, you had a spell at Penrith. Uh, and then at Parramatta. So, um, how did the how did the move to Huddersfield actually come about? Because you came halfway through the year, didn't you? Yeah, um, yeah. I remember there was another opportunity for me at the Panthers, um, the Eels, you know, and it was a, it was a good experience as well. And you know, um, I was coming to the end of the contract at the Eels, and um, 
this opportunity, you know, the Huddersfield Giants opened up and they sort of ex uh, explained to me um, where they were at. And I think it was, uh, you know, if they lost a few more games, it was a possible opportunity of um, relegations. I don't know how the comp went at the time, but, mm. you know, they had to try and stay in the top eight. So that explains why I sort of came. Uh, I came to try and, um, you know, try and do anything I can to help out the team stuff to try and keep us in the eight at least. And I think I thought we'd come over and it was a good good role. Yeah. yeah, I think it was twelve games in a row. I'm gonna say I think you were Simon's first signing, weren't you? You might have been Simon's first yeah, signing. I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. And then we yeah we we won about twelve games on the bounce, didn't we? Yeah, and it was man coming here was you know. Um, Good energy and stuff like that. I was like, man, the boys on the roll, and there was a lot of confidence in the team. And um, I'm pretty confident we can, um, you know, once we get fix these little things, you know, about yeah. discipline, our errors, and just playing basic. I think, um, you know, that that 12 row can, you know, can come. And you know, how good would it be if, you know, we go into a 12 um, no yeah, break at yeah. all? But if, you know, if we can string up um, some confidence and get that, you know, because it's there. We saw, you know, we saw a little bit of it last year. And it's, Probably the same team, I guess. I didn't really look into it, but you know, um, I think it just if we do the basics right, you know, um, preparation, you know, um, get that sort of right, you know, then the confidence will come off there and we can play some good footy. Um, we've got quite a, quite a few young lads coming through uh, that are, that are going to be great players. Um, you've been around a long time. You've you've done it tough. You've come up the hard the hard way. Do you, I mean, do you be part of the leadership group? Um, you know, do you? Do you put your arm around some of these boys sometimes, or have you got any words of advice for them on a regular, yeah. regular basis? Yeah, when um, when we get the opportunity, can yeah, we we do go around. Um, a lot of the boys just do it naturally, but um, yeah, yeah when we when we do get opportunity to step in and, and talk to them, um, we help out wherever we can, and there are times when we need to pick them up and encourage the boys, you know, um, especially young guys, um, because it has been tough days. You know, preseason is one of the toughest um, parts of the season, so. Um, you know, there's times when everyone's naked and you know the body's sort of hurting. Um, that's when you sort of pick up um, and help the boys out and let them know, man. And, you know, pick them up and yeah. just encourage them more with us to give them advice and help them through the game. That's something we sort of do naturally. Anyway, we look to help out wherever we can. So it's been good and like you said, uh, it's good to see the young boys coming through, uh, putting their hand up. You know, I thought they've led the way. Um, so the twenty boys and men English and all that coming through. It's um, turning going to make the club even better. And that, that's, that's something as well. When you listen to any punditry on the Giants at all, especially the, over the weekend, they, they always talk about this, this mix of the young and mm. the, it seems to you know the young and veteran players, and it, and then that seems to be the the stamp on the field Giants at the moment is that that mix of young and old. In a way, I, I think you know Ollie Russell had a great game. Yeah, yeah. And at the weekend, you know, I think we have got some great young players coming through, uh, but we've also got a mixture of of experience. You know, people like yourself, you know, Kermit Tai, Lee Gaskell, Paul Clough. You know, all these players. I'm sure I've missed loads out there, but you know, just off the top of my head, you know, there's some mm. players with experience that. You know, we have got a, a real good mix at the minute. Yeah. I feel you know, so it's promising for the future as well. And looking forward to the future, we've got uh, Castleford in the June seventh. So you've got a bit of a break for you, for yourself now. The training continues. And how do you prepare for a game which could be, as you said, really important in terms of looking up up the table now? Yeah, uh, we just got to take it one game at a time now. Um, we know Castleford uh, went down to uh, St Helens, so we know they'll be preparing their best to try and get uh, the two points. So we know it's no easy beat. Uh, we just got to prepare well this week um, into next week and. Um, get our confidence up, you know, build some momentum, and um, you know, try and go for the two points. I know it's going to be a tough game, and Castleford is not going to um, give it to us as well. It's a home game for them, so yeah. Castleford are, uh, you know, a team that we've we've beaten earlier on in the season. Do you think it gives you the, the that mental edge? You know, that extra one percent you talk about, knowing that we've already been capable of beating them. Um, you know, is, is that something that you think about going into the game? Uh, a little bit, but I know every game's different, you know, um, they come here, so different sort of contact, so when we're going there, um, we just got to um, be fresh, I guess, and go for our attitude, um, to be hungry, and to go for those two points, uh, how it's going to come, but we're going to be just like we played in the Magic Cup, um, Magic Weekend, you know, we've got to put on a team performance, um, do the basics right again, and I think, we'll, you know, whatever the results, the results will take care of itself, if we, you know, do this little stuff right. 
But we know Castleford's a, a strong team that can score points as well, so we're going to pick up our defence game as well and, and, and go from there. Uh, if we've got nothing else to add, I'll, uh, I'll tell you that Suai is up for uh, Player of the Month, which you can, uh, if, when you're listening, you can vote for on the uh, Huddersfield Giants website. So uh, I think you've had a good enough week. I reckon you'll get a couple of votes in at least. <laughs> no, thanks. But, um, yeah, f- thanks very much for joining us, Suai. If you've got nothing else to say, no, that's um, brilliant. Thanks, Suai. It's been uh, it's been it's been great hearing about the past and how you've ended up here. And good luck for the rest of the season. You've been brilliant for us this year already. I think. Oh, thank yeah, you. Re- really brilliant story. It's fascinating to see that and oh. amazing how much it means to you as well. So, thanks very much for that. And oh. uh, we'll be back next week. Appreciate thank you very much. <sighs> brilliant. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Thanks, thanks very much for that. It's bloody freezing in here, isn't it? Not too bad, mate. <laughs>